Just for fun, I asked an AI to compose an introduction to this video for you in the role as a dungeon master writing the intro to a combat encounter in Hades, and here is what it came up with. As the party of adventurers becomes aware of the approaching dragon, you may feel a sense of dread wash over them. The creature's undead appearance with its diseased and emaciated frame is a clear indication of the kind of danger they are facing. The dragon's vulture-like head and lack of wings only add to its intimidating presence as it slithers across the ruins of Hades, surrounded by the remains of infernal creatures and ancient war machines. As the dragon gets closer, the sense of evil in the location becomes almost palpable. The party can feel the darkness closing in on them, as if the dragon itself is wrapped in the very essence of this cursed place. They can feel the urge to run, but they know there is nowhere to go in the bleak and desolate landscape. All they can do is stand their ground and hope that they have the skills and strength to defeat this formidable beast. As the dragon approaches, the party may try to assess its weaknesses and come up with a plan of attack. They may try to use ranged weapons to take the dragon down from a distance, or they may try to engage it in close combat. Either way, the battle is sure to be intense and perilous as the dragon unleashes its full range of terrifying abilities as it tries to take down its prey. Ultimately, it will be up to the adventurers to use all of their skills and cunning to emerge victorious and escape the grasp of this grim and depressing gloom of Hades. Nice effort, but let me show you how a real dungeon master depicts the scene. And if you are currently eating, I strongly advise you to pause this video right now and continue after your stomach is nicely settled. A tasty beverage should be safe though. For hours, or perhaps days now, who can tell in this eternal darkness and foul smog? Your party has trudged across this bleak landscape of endless mud, filthy puddles, what is certainly not water, but more ponds of waste and decay, littered with sharp broken bones, fangs, and rusted old weapons of dull green infernal iron. You can sense the presence of something absolutely malicious stalking you. Only now and then do you catch sight of something in the murk, as your pitiful light and feeble dark vision struggles to penetrate the clouds of biting insects. The gaze at puffs of exploding corpses of massive size, no doubt the remains of gargantuan war beasts brought to this realm by any number of factions in the eternal blood wars, always raging far off like some threatening growl that rumbles through the broken hills, ragged ravines and misty, trench-filled plains that surround the black and loathsome waters of the river Styx. Always close by, as you dare not lose sight of it, or be forever doomed to wander Hades for the rest of what is sure to be very short lives, and the accursed eternity thereafter, as even your soul can escape this place. A muffled sound reaches you, and suddenly you spin in the mud as intense waves of apathy and despair wash over you, a supernatural aura drawn from the very power of Hades itself. It is nothing like dragon fear. It seeps into your very marrow and seems to rob you of your strength. The adventurers try to conceal their shaking hands and buckling knees from their companions, but no bravery can withstand this assault. As the dragon finally rears, it's hunched back and gathers its emaciated limbs under it to pounce on its victims. They can hear the screams and feel their throats grow ragged as they understand they are making these noises themselves. The fear is so intense it looses bladders and bowels and even the staunchest warriors. The dragon looks gaunt and skeletal, and has a beak-like snout resembling that of a vulture. Its tightly drawn hide of rough cracked scales alternates in uneven patterns between white and black tones. Its flesh is riddled with bloated, straining pustules, riddled with the eggs of countless teeming parasites that burst in sprays of heat-seeking virulence the moment any sharp blade slices open its black and slime-oozing flesh. A line of uneven plates runs down its hunched spine, each in the shape of a grim headstone, or so it seems, and each bone-like plate bears what looks like ancient arcane writing which seems to skitter and shift under the scrutiny of mortal eyes. A thin greenish-grey mist, also the colour of the dragon's dimly glowing, dead-looking eyes, swirls around its legs as it tenses its sinewy body and coils its long, thin tail. At first glance, the dragon looks clearly to be either diseased or to the point of death, or it has already crossed over and is now undead, but it is neither. This is not a dragon of the primaterial plane. This is a manifestation of the draconic spirit, twisted and turned into a vile and terrible monster by the plane of Hades itself. And while it glares at you with the intensity of a cat watching the every movement of a mouse, you start to suspect this fight will wound your mind and spirit just as much as those wicked, filthy claws are going to rip your fragile flesh and bones apart. 
Roll for initiative and draw your weapons, lest this be the last thing you ever witness with the eyes of a living being. Beat that robot. Originally published in Dragon Magazine issue 344 in June of 2006, it is a relatively recent addition to the Dragon Menagerie. The original artwork is interesting, but I would not be particularly terrified of that. No, in person this dragon would be one of the most hideous and obviously deeply, deeply evil and absolutely malevolent creatures, with a keen intelligence just packed full of sadistic cruelty. It plays out like fantasies to amuse itself. When it does take living victims rather than just feeding on the sloppy infested carrion, it consumes them body and soul. The soul is digested, one could say. Over decades, the dragon leeches part of the soul's energy and vigor to better study it, and the psychological trauma of its dark whispers can easily drive those consumed souls utterly insane before they are lost so completely only the legendary wish spell could ever bring them back and restore them. The gloom dragons typically lair along the banks of the river Styx and cave networks. They flock to the first layer of Oinos for the rich pickings in its victims for their amusements. While other dragons use their physical might to overpower and tear up victims to shreds, the gloom dragons of Hades avoid combat. They would actually run if offered serious resistance to getting eaten, but they are not giving up. Far from it. They will return and use their supernatural abilities from a safe distance instead. Most of the time, the dragons just creep around eating the amazingly foul corpses littering the plain from the ever-present chaos of the blood war. But given the chance to stalk, murder, leave to rot, and then consume the corpse of a living being, they will almost always be baited into this sort of fight. Physically smaller and weaker than even many true dragons of the mortal worlds, the Gloom Dragon is cunning enough to avoid any combat that has a chance to kill them, as to die on this plane is as terrible a fate for even a creature native to it. They will carefully assess their prey, stalking out of sight, just revealing itself now and then as it enjoys the rich and interesting smell of terrified living beings. Still, it is a dragon with a bite capable of severing a human skull like a split coconut full of brains and gore. It enjoys the taste of such unusually vital and rich flesh from the prime material plane, but it still will not consume any meat not quite far along in its decay. Thankfully, this never takes very long in Hades, particularly the first layer of Oinos. Some would say that their realm is the very mother of all the plagues of the multiverse, and it's hard to disagree. While not mortal beings, the Gloom Dragons still emulate their living counterparts. They do breed and produce offspring and die of old age, just fairly rarely and Many offspring have almost no chance to survive to adulthood in this intensely dangerous place. Often the wormlings will simply take to the very waters of the river Styx, hunting down other creatures both above the water and within it, including many forms of aquatic demon that are quite common on the river. Clutches of eggs, the size and general sh appearance of rotten cabbages cluster in shallow pools of entropic muck excreted by the parent in the birthing process, deep within twisted and well-protected cavern lairs. Remember, the sandy sediment found on the floor of the river Styx is no ordinary material. It is the condensed memory stripped away from those infernal waters, and it is extremely valuable to some who have use for such things. And really, the memories of billions of beings over countless eons, there are all kinds of hidden secrets lost in there. The extraction and trade in this substance is as difficult and dangerous as the mining of memory crystals in the dangerous depths of the astral plane, where it approaches the fugue realm of Kalimvor who also has a presence in Hades, kind of protecting all of the memories, both those lost on purpose and by mistake or tragedy. But of course, the Gloom Dragons are ample protection in and of themselves and thrive on the constant supply of fools who would dare wander the shores of the Styx near their hidden lairs, many of which are ancient and well-established locations on their own, with a local history every bit as rich and complicated as some mortal kingdoms. Rising and falling in power, wealth and prominence according to the might and activity of the dragon or dragons who currently occupy them. In some cases, Twisted Cave Lair is what they began as, but by now our massive mega dungeons stocked with a multiverse of horrors gathered by the long, long generations of dragons who have each called the lair their own and contributed to its epic contents. So how lethal is a Gloom Dragon? Here is a conversion of the 3.5 edition listing into the current 5th edition rule set. I find this version by Dr. Death Air has a great combination of abilities that reflect well just how lethal this creature is. Let's have a look here. So it's got an armor class of 19, 253 hit points, a speed of 40 feet and a burrow of 10 feet and he's listed it with a flying speed of 80 feet but I can't find anywhere that these things have wings. 
In fact, most creatures in Hades don't fly. Strength of 25, Dex of 10, Constitution of 21, Intelligence of 18, Wisdom of 17, and Charisma of 20. It's a challenge rating 15, proficiency bonus plus 5. It's got an aura of gloom, green mist, constantly roils around the gloom dragon and each creature that enters for the first time on their turn or ends their turn within 15 feet of the gloom dragon must make a DC 18 wisdom saving throw or be frightened. A creature can make and remake the saving throw at the end of their turn. Legendary resistance three times a day, of course. Magic resistance, of course. Eternal consumption means that the dragon can eat a body recently killed by them if it has no more than two sides carry smaller size than itself as an action. In one minute, a tombstone shall appear on the gloom dragon's back. The tombstone plate records the consumed creature's name, if any, date and place of birth, and the date and place of death. This can only be fixed via a very, very specific wish spell wording. Now, after using the wish, the creature can then be resurrected, but only if the Gloom Dragon is dead. Innate spellcasting allows it to cast sleep three times a day and hold monster once a day, but I would add a rich selection of spells of the paralysis and manipulation of its victims. It has a biting attack and two claws. The wasting bite is plus 12 to hit. Got to reach 10 feet. Hits one target for 18 piercing damage. And the target may make a DC 18 constitution saving throw or be infected with the gray wasting disease in which the creature has their charisma drained by 1d4 at the start of each hour. Their claws are also plus 12 to hit, reach of 5 feet, and they do 14 slashing damage. The tail... When it does slash around with it, it is also plus 12 to hit. It has a reach of 15 feet. And although it lists one target taking 16 bludgeoning damage, there's no reason why it wouldn't target an entire party with that whipping thing. It's huge. The Gloom Dragon exhales apathy gas in a 60-foot cone. <laughs> Words do not describe how foul this stuff is. Each creature within the radius must make a DC 18 wisdom saving throw or be unable to take any actions other than movement. A creature can remake the save at the end of their turn <laughs> and it, it doesn't really reflect the virulent disease and massive attack of parasites that victim is undergoing at that time. The legendary actions, uh, it can detect creatures using wisdom detection check. It can make a tail attack and it uses tombstone terror which costs two actions of its three actions per round that it takes in other creatures' turns. The Gloom Dragon chooses one creature within 120 feet of themselves that they can see and that the creature must make a DC 18 wisdom saving throw or take 31 necrotic damage and can't take any actions until the end of your next turn. A nasty creature indeed. Best of luck everyone, my advice would be to avoid them and certainly stay off the shores of the river Styx if you ever must travel that way, ensure you find a ferryman, daemon and pay him very, very well. My name is AJ Pickett, I make lore videos for role playing games, gathering information from every edition and source I can find to bring you only the best content that I can and shall always do and by then I will have programmed an AI to replace me. <laughs> Until then, as always, thanks for listening and I shall be back with more for you very soon.